Well, it's good to be here tonight. Amen. Take the Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and um, hold your place there. And I got something in Revelation 1 I want us to look at to sort of get into the to the teaching tonight. Um, what does it mean to be in the spirit? And we're talking about we're just teaching fundamental ideas from the Bible. What does the Bible teach us about God, who God is? Well, you know, we're supposed to get our idea of who God is from the Bible. That's the book that God wrote about himself and sent it down here to the prophets. They wrote down the words that God told them to write down. Those words have been preserved all these years. It's an amazing, amazing book. There are books that are not as old as the Bible that are not anywhere near the shape that the Bible's in. And um, they made a discovery, if you've ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest Old Testament books that we had uh, don't go back before the time of Christ. That was the oldest Old Testament manuscript that we had prior to 1947. And in 1947, a shepherd boy out in the middle of the desert, uh, tending his sheep, wandered in some caves and found these clay jars just sitting there. Hundreds of them. And he lifts the lid on them and there's scrolls down in there. Well, it turns out to be probably the biggest archaeological find in the world. Because those scrolls were scrolls of the Old Testament that dated back hundreds of years before Christ. And when they matched the scrolls from before Christ to the copies we had several hundred years after Christ came, they were identical. It was amazing that God had preserved His Word through thousands of years. And like I said, there are, there are newer books that we know of that are in far worse shape than the Bible is. So God preserved these words for us. And um, this is how we can know who God really is. Who God is, who Jesus really is, um, who, what, who and what the Holy Ghost, who He is, what He does, what He doesn't do. Because there's a lot of, I think, a lot of false teaching about the Holy Spirit that comes out of people that is not in the Bible. And here's their excuse, and I love this one. Not everything that God wants us to know is in the Bible. Oh, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. I mean, how else are we supposed to know it except it be in the book that he wrote? And uh, so that's just an excuse to get by with believing whatever you want to believe. But it's in the, it's in the word of God. So anyway, um, Revelation chapter one, uh, I want us to look at verse uh, uh, nine. We'll start there. We're going to read just a couple verses. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. This was written. The book of Revelation was written somewhere around 95 A.D. We could have sort of know that. John was the oldest apostle, the oldest of the original 12 disciples. He was the one disciple that didn't get his head cut off or wasn't crucified upside down or wasn't martyred. He was the one disciple that died of old age. And he was in his 90s. And so he, here he is somewhere around 95 AD. And he says, I'm your brother and I'm your companion in tribulation in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why was he on the island of Patmos? It's because... The Roman government hated him. They didn't like him because he preached Jesus Christ. They didn't like that. They tried to kill him. History and tradition tells us that they tried to kill John by throwing him in a vat of boiling oil. And it didn't kill him. Now, I don't know what's worse, being killed in a vat of boiling oil or living through trying to be killed in a vat of boiling oil. But he lived through it. And so they said, well, if we can't kill him, we'll just get him out away from everybody. And yet John writes probably what I think is one of the most important books in the whole Bible. Because it tells us, it's not telling us what has happened, it's telling us what's going to happen. And so, but verse 10 says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. What does that mean, I was in the spirit? What does that mean? 
Does that mean that he was uh, passed out in a trance, speaking in tongues, barking like a dog? Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's, I think it's very simple. I think John, on the Lord's Day, was doing what we do on the Lord's Day, or what we attempt to do on the Lord's Day. Prayer and Scripture. Those two things right there. There is nothing greater that a Christian can do than to pray and read his Bible. Amen. Nothing greater than that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And John here was in, in the Spirit. He was reading the Scriptures, and he was in prayer, and the Lord Jesus himself showed up. So, you know, that's to me, that's what being in the Spirit is, and I'll explain that as we go on. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you guide us and lead us as we study your word, we do believe this book is the word of God. Father, if there's anybody qualified to write about heaven and earth and the things that are therein, it's the one who created it. It's the one who has seen all of earth's history, seen the actions and deeds of every man. The one who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come and die for us so that we could live forever. And Father, we believe that we have every word that you have sent down from heaven contained in this book. We believe this book. And Father, I pray, dear God, that if anybody hearing my voice tonight, uh, Lord, that you would increase their faith and build the, what they already believe and build on that and teach them more things. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we pray as the disciples prayed that you would increase our faith in what this book says and help us to believe it help us to believe it in spite of what the world says or maybe in spite of what another preacher might say help us to believe and trust what we find in your word father we seek to be in the spirit tonight doing spiritual things things that honor and please you here in the midst of the week we've come together once again to seek you and to fellowship with people that we love and people that we know love us. And we just pray, dear God, that that spirit of love would pervade in this place tonight. Open our eyes and help us to learn, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now back in Ephesians. Uh, we've talked about the Holy Ghost as the comforter. He is the guide of our lives. He's the one that the Holy Ghost is the spirit that is with you when you did something wrong. When you sinned, God's Holy Spirit was there. He knows what you did, so there's no use hiding it. And God's Spirit then will press on you the discomfort of your sin. He will convict you of your sin. He will tell you this is what you did was wrong, and you and you should not do those things. And will cause us then to repent before God. So He is our comforter. He's our guide. But then He is, and I touched on this last Wednesday. Told you we'd talk about it tonight. He's our partner in prayer. The whole, when John was in the Spirit, he was reading the Scriptures, studying the Scriptures, meditating on, the, and thinking. Meditating means to think on these things. Doesn't mean empty your mind and create a void. It means to ponder and think about what the Bible is saying. And, and so that the Holy Ghost then can bring other Scriptures to your memory and add scripture to scripture and, and thereby giving you understanding. And that's what it means to be in the spirit. And so, but, so when we pray in the spirit, it means that we are allowing God's spirit to lead us on things to pray for. I've had people call me, brother Mike, how are you doing today? Uh, well, kind of having a rough day. Why? Well, the Holy Spirit laid it on my heart to pray for you this morning, and I just felt like maybe I needed to call you and check on you. Well, I'm glad you did, because I'm having a really rough day. That happens quite a bit. God will impress it upon one to pray for another, and that's praying in the Spirit, letting God's Spirit lead you as you pray. So Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible tells us praying always. Now, is it possible to pray always well let me just say this we know it's not possible to pray while we're asleep I think we can settle that but and let me help you with this one there's nothing wrong with praying yourself to sleep nothing wrong with that at all 
And I, and I bet you've done this. You lay your head down at night and you start praying and you go to sleep. In the middle of it. And then you wake up. <sighs> God, I'm sorry for going to sleep. Right? Who's done that? Raise your hand. Of course you have. But God's not upset. Unless, of course, that's the only time you've ever talked to God during that day. But I'd rather go to sleep talking to my Lord Jesus with the comfort of the Holy Ghost on me than doing anything else in the world trying to go to sleep. I'd rather be it that way than any other way. So pray always, I think, means to always have a mind open toward God. So we bring this verse back in. I quote a while ago. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means you take God. When you get up in the morning. You take God with you. In your thoughts. And you can talk to God with your thoughts. You can even do it while your eyes are open. When you go to work. Or on your way to work. You can be talking to God while you're driving your car. And please do not close your eyes. That is, Cubby's told me that police statistics show that that's unsafe. To do that while you're driving. But you can talk to God. How's God going to talk back? He's going to talk back by way of the Holy Ghost. Either while you don't have a Bible in front of you, by bringing Scripture to mind, or while you're reading the Bible, and then showing you Scriptures and what possible meaning they might have for you in their life. So, Pastor, you saying that God never speaks outside of the Bible? That is pretty much exactly what I'm saying. In fact, the Bible tells us to test the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. We know that there are seducing spirits out there. We know that there are things that we will hear. We don't, I don't hear them with my ears. It's hard to describe how I hear them, but through the thought processes of my mind, ideas and things will pop into my head. And I then must ask the question, does what I, the thought that just crossed my mind, does that break the scripture? In other words, does it contradict something that I know is in my Bible? In other words, you, you might get some idea that they painted a mustache on Jesus in his blood while they hang him on the cross or some nonsense thing like that. Well, that's not... You read the Bible all day long, never find that. Discard it. Throw it out. It didn't come from God. And what difference does it make, right? Okay? And I've, I've sat with people who, I, I had a guy one time, he was homeless, and he had a car full of his stuff, and his dog, and he came by here one day, scared me to the big guy, and he was trying to tell me some revelation he had gotten from God, and as he, there was something he said that I knew was not right according to what the Bible said, and I said, Sir, let me, before you go on, let me stop you right here. You said this, and I quoted the verse. I can't remember what it was, but I quoted the scripture for him. And he said, well, if you just let me finish. I said, but we can't finish. Scripture, if, you're, if what you're saying is based upon what you just said, we got to throw out what you said because what you said is wrong according to scripture. And I can tell the more that I impress that idea upon him, the more... I could tell he got a little heated. And at some point, it was either God telling me or my own fear telling me, Mike, back down. And I let him talk a little bit, and I said, okay, is that your point? He said, yes. I said, I'm going to go back to what I said. It broke scripture. I cannot say it. He just said contradict something that I know the Bible says. Then I can't believe it. I can't trust in that. So that's how you pray in the spirit. You let God lead you and the guidelines of God leading you are always going to be with the word of God. So 
let's just throw out an example. Let's say that you're not happy with the spouse that you have and you're saying, God, this uh, other woman that I've been seeing on the side, I want you to bless that relationship. And I've actually had somebody bring that to me. Oh, I think God really meant for us, me and this other woman to be together. We're soulmates. I said, are you kidding me? This man had a wife and about three young children, four young children, something like that. And he was in church. And, and I'm going, what you're saying is you want God to bless your adultery. And God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. You can't ask God to bless something that he says is wrong. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. So you, you can pray all you want to. God, I want you to bless me with this new woman that I've got. And yet everything about that is wrong scripturally. You're not in the spirit. It's that simple. God, make me a multi-billionaire and I'll serve you. God, Jesus says, follow me. I didn't have a dime. And I'll make you fishers of men. Then you're in my kingdom. Amen. So Ephesians 6, 8, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And that means following the Bible's guidelines. Pray according to what you know is in the nature and character of and within the blessing range of God, what you know. And if you don't know enough about that, read more Bible. And God will be patient with you while you learn. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So here's the supplication for all saints. I said that a while ago. God will lay people on your heart to pray for. And you don't know why you're praying for them. God, I don't know why I'm praying for them, but they're on my heart. God, will you deal with them? Or God, will you bless them? Or God, will you work in their life? God, you've brought them into my heart. You've brought them into my mind. And I am praying for them right now. God, will you work a miracle in their life? Because I believe they need it. And that's what that means. So the Holy Ghost then guides you and leads you into what to pray for. And when that happens, you won't have to worry about whether or not God will answer the prayer. Turn to John 15 and I'll show you that. John 15. John 15 is where Jesus talks about he is the vine and we are the branches. He talks about us bearing, bearing the fruit. The branch is Christ or he is the vine. He's the one that produces the fruit. He just asks us to bear the fruit. It's his fruit, not ours. So then he says in verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And if a man abide not in me, is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. What do you think that means, God will cast them into the, or men will cast them into the fire? What do you think that means? When God sees a branch on the vine that's not holding any fruit, and it remains unfruitful, the vine dresser will cut that branch off and it'll wither and it'll die. And the, then men will throw it in the fire. What do you think that means? It means hell. It means hell. Those who won't bear fruit, those who won't manifest the fruit that God wants to produce in their life, God's, God cuts them off. He says, you're unfruitful. I have no part with you. So then he says, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. There it is. That's the same thing as saying the spirit is abiding in you. Because Jesus said in the next chapter, John, uh, listen, no, in John, not, not John 16, John 6. If you turn back to John 6 very quickly, Jesus says in no uncertain terms that his words are. The Spirit. He says it in verse 60, 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. So if you go back to John 15, 
And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, when his word abides in you, that is the same as his spirit abiding in you. Because the spirit will always speak within the guidelines of his written word. You know, when they talk about the spirit of the law and the letter of the law, they use that terminology even in courtrooms today. What, when they talk about the spirit of the law, they're talking about what the law was intended for, originally intended for. Did a, if you go read the, the, what our founding fathers said, our original politicians in America, if you go read what they said about God, you will not believe that our founding fathers believed there should be a concrete wall of separation between religion and our government. Because our government was religious men who believed the word of God. And it was, in fact, I'll give you this. The man who gave, who came up with the wording for the amendment that says Congress shall pass no law establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The man who came up with the wording for that amendment said, I believe that the Bible should be in every schoolroom in America. That's what he said. He didn't, didn't intend that we should separate every idea of God from religion. That was not the spirit of the laws that they gave us. And so that's that same idea. The spirit is the word of God. And if you will pray in this, if, if, if God's word abides in you, verse back in John 15 again, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, verse 7, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now, people take that verse and make you think that you, if you just ask for healing, God has to give it to you. You should be healed of every disease. And you should never be in want of anything financially. And if you are, you're not praying right. You're not doing something right. Or God is not happy with you somehow, some way. Because the Bible says, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done for you. But when you put it in the context of what he said before that, if God's word is abiding in you, how, who in here really thinks that it would be a good idea for you to have an unlimited amount of money in your life? I don't think that. And sometimes I worry how we're going to pay our bills around here. And I ask God, God, pay our bills. And in almost 11 years, we've never had a bill that we couldn't pay. Never. Amen. Never. And so what were we thinking adding two radio stations on top of all that, Michael? That's your fault. And then feeding all those people. Who's going to pay for that? Well, it was God's idea, so he pays for it, amen. So I don't think that we should get an unlimited amount of money. But I do think that we can ask God each and every month and each and every week for God to help us, and God always does. Amen. See, that's what I'm talking about. When God's word is in you, when, when you know what this Bible, you, when you know the nature of God because you read his word, you know what God will go along with and you know what God will think. God will say, that's nonsense. I'm not blessing you with that. I am going to give you something better and you may not agree with it right now, but when I give it to you, you'll go, well, why didn't I think of that? And that's where we're going next. Romans chapter 8, turn there. Romans chapter 8. This is where... The doctrine of people like Joyce Myers, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hindu, and all these others. This is why they are absolutely wrong in 95% of what they teach. Because they have a mindset that if you ask for healing, God has to give it to you. If you ask for money, God has to give it to you. And they even say that the words that you've chosen matter to God. If you don't ask with the right words, of course God won't give it to you because you didn't ask with the right words. And that is not biblical. I mean, think about it. Who's the adult 
in this relationship that we have between us and God. Who's the adult? God's the adult. God is the one who knows better than us children know what's good for us and what's not. If you let your children, if you give, if I gave Roland every drop of candy that he's ever wants me to give him, is that good idea, Courtney? No. But I'll do it anyway. We're the adults here with these children. Yeah, we know that it's not a good idea for them to have all the unlimited supply of candy they want, right? We're the adults. And besides that, Roland doesn't even know how to ask for it the right way all the time. I just know when he comes in, I know what he wants. Right? Did you hear what I just said? I already know what he wants. So Romans 8. Verse 26, likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We have infirmities. We don't do everything right. We don't say everything right. We don't think everything right. We're not always right. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Underline that in your Bible. When they tell you that you must specify to God how it's to be done, how much is to be given to you, and so on and so on, you go back and read this verse again. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, they will tell you that that is you praying in tongues. But it says, it's, it can't be that it's you praying in tongues. It didn't say with groanings in tongues. It said groanings that cannot be uttered. And if God said they cannot be uttered, that means you cannot utter them. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to who? Whose will? The will of God. And that's another thing. That's, and that, boy, that opened up a can of worms here one night, several years ago, in this church, because we had this influence of this name it, claim it, starting to move in this church. And I cut it off very quickly. I said, I'm not going to have that. Because somebody came in with this Bible that had all these notes in it, and the notes under the scripture said, don't ever begin your prayer with, Lord, if it be thy will. They said to pray that is committing spiritual suicide. You will never get anything from God if you say, Lord, if it be thy will. You must boldly proclaim what it is that you desire of God and speak it in and it, God has manifested. That's witchcraft as far as I'm concerned. If it was good enough for Jesus to say it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Lord, if to be under the way, that let this cup pass from before me. Nevertheless, let not my will be done, but thy will be done. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us to pray. And here it says it right here in verse 27, that we, the Spirit will make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And here's the thing. The more you know about the Bible, the more that what you desire will line up with what God desires. And you'll be asking for things that you know God already wants out of your life. Or at what God already wants out of somebody else. Or what you know what God's already going to do. And you pray for that. And of course your prayer is going to be answered. Because you and God are in agreement. God is the one who is fulfilling the request. But God is also the one who is leading us in what to pray for. And we don't have to. There are no magic words to make God do something. There is no line of prayer that if we pray that it God manifests what we want on site right then and right there. There is nothing like that in scripture. But you have people who prayed and God who is bigger than all of us put together and smarter than all of us put together. By the way, I, there's an article I saw. I was going to mention it tonight. We're building God's brain. Google just announced that their quantum computer 
And I've been, I've been waiting for this. A couple years ago, I learned that mathematicians have an equation that the, the fastest computer in the world, that if this equation was put into this IBM fastest computer thing, it would take 10,000 years for it to solve the equation. Google's computer did it in 200 seconds. Quantum computers. We reduced a 10,000 year equation, riddle to solve, down to 200 seconds. We're building a God. We're building a God. And it's not going to be a good God. It's a dangerous one. Okay? So anyway, God, and by the way, it didn't take God 200 seconds. Figure that one out. Okay? But anyway, um, this is teaching us, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So when we pray, we don't have to have all the right words. When we pray, we don't have to make long words. When we pray, we don't have to make long speeches. When we pray, we don't have to use large sentences. When we, and when we pray, we don't have to keep asking over and over and over for the same thing. We don't have to say please a thousand times. We don't have to get a thousand people in with us to pray more for us. What it takes is a broken heart. If something is important to you, you will pray for it multiple times. But God heard you the first time. Now God will wait till his time is right before he answers your prayer. Sometimes there will be a spiritual hindrance to the prayer answer. We know that from the book of Daniel. Okay, but the bottom line is God is greater than all the devils put together who would try to stop your prayer from being answered. And even 21 days, Michael fought against the prince of the people of Persia when it came to the prayer of Daniel. But after 21 days, Michael prevailed. God answered the prayer. Ephesians 3.20. Turn there. And this, this you hear me say a lot. Ephesians 3, and then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12, just very quickly as part of that. Because 2 Corinthians 12 is an illustration of what I'm about to read to you. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, do it, to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And by the way, I don't believe that you have to speak it out loud so God can hear you. Now, I don't have a problem praying out loud. But I don't think it's absolutely, well, thought prayers, I, who knows if God hears that. Of course he hears it. Of course God, God heard it before you were born, God heard it. So, that, and that's what he says here, above all that we ask or think. My wife prays. I know she does. I don't hear my wife pray very often. But I know she prays. She prays out of her heart. She prays for me. She prays for this church. She prays for her children, her grandchildren. And God hears her. And there are times when I didn't think my prayers were contradictory to my wife's prayers. I didn't think God can answer both of them, and he did. Because he answers them above what we're able to ask or think. God's way smarter than we are. God's the adult in this relationship. God is the one who knows. God is the one who knows what the children who can't say the right words, God knows what they want before they even ask it. And that's what that means. So you can pray all day long. Out of your heart, you can pray. You can pray when you're eating. You can pray when you're driving. You can pray 
when you're changing diapers, you can pray when you're nailing boards on, you can pray when you're at work, you can pray, you can pray all the time if you want, you can pray. But God always answers the prayer, and here's my, my life rule, either how we prayed it or better than we prayed it. But he never, ever tells us no. Never. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. I'll give you an example of what I just said. And see, I, these three verses, Ephesians 6, Romans 8, Ephesians 3. Um, and you can add John 15 in there as well. They're telling you how to, how your prayers work. The prayers that you pray work when your will and God's will match. Even if they're close. Close is good enough with God. So when your will, when you're praying something that you know is in the will of God, that, that pleases God, that honors His kingdom first. When you hear me pray out loud, you hear me pray, God, for your name's sake, for your kingdom's sake, do this. Don't do it for me, do it for you. When you uplift God in your prayers and you are more concerned about God's kingdom than your own desires, when you are that way, of course God's going to answer your prayers. And you know what God will do? Because you honored him first, God will give you what you asked for better than what you asked for just as a consolation prize to you. Because you said, God, I'll pray to you and I'll seek your will even if it hurts me. I will seek out your will. Even if it causes me grief and heartache and trial and troubles. I will seek your kingdom and your righteousness first. Knowing that if you'll do that, God will add unto you all these other things. That's just how it works. So 2 Corinthians, here's Paul with his thorn. And um, there, I have a friend that... I speak to on occasion, we text message back and forth, and he has just of, let's say the last year or two, he's been made aware of a thorn that God has placed in his life. Who put it there? God did. Why did God put it there? So that God's glory can be seen in this friend of mine. And I'm not telling you who it is, or, and, and they're going to tell you what it's about. But I know it's a thorn. I know what it is. I recognize it as soon as he started telling me about it. And I'm going, you've got a thorn, bro. Amen. Praise God. God's going to do something with that. Okay. And so Paul's, here's Paul, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians uh, 12. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And then you hear you have these prosperity people telling you to cast all the devils out in your life and then you'll be rich and you'll be healthy and you won't have any disease. And here God, here God dispatched a devil to Paul to buffet him every day he was alive. And these people are telling you, well, God's not answering your prayers because you got devils in your life. God put them there. Why did he do that? And so Paul said, verse 8, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Well, somebody would say, well, if Paul would have prayed a fourth time, God would have done it. Or Paul didn't have enough faith. Are we kidding ourselves? This is Paul. And so verse 9, he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Did you see who he put first? Jesus first. Not his own desire to have the thorn taken out. He put Jesus first. And Paul then gave consent. God, if you want to leave it there, that's fine with me. I'll accept that as being better than what I asked for. And that's, you can write this down. I'm telling you, this is how it is. God will either give you what you asked for or better, which is sometimes different than what you asked for. But I guarantee you it's better than what you asked for. But he doesn't tell his children, no. 
Where is it in the scriptures, in the, one of the gospels, where Jesus said, if any of you fathers, if any of you fathers, if your child comes up to you and asks for a fish, you're going to give them a scorpion? And of course the answer is no, you're going to give them a fish. And then he said, if you, being evil, will give good things to your children, how much more your heavenly father, who is not evil, will give you good things? And he'll never give you bad things. Never. You say, well, I've got bad things in my life. They're not bad according to God. He's using them to humble you. He's using them to get you to put God's kingdom first. Or put some, some God's using that thing in your life to make you better for his kingdom's sake. I guarantee you that's what it's about. Learn to live with it. Learn to, so what if, what if it's a sin? What if the thorn is a sin? Because he said he asked God thrice, and I know that number is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So what if there's a sin in your life that has not left you, and you've begged God, take it out of my life? Now, two things I know. In time, God might just do that. But while God, and if you ask God to take it out, who's the only one then that can take it out? God. If he put it there, can you take it out? No. You don't have the power to do it. You, we ought to know this by now, you are completely powerless against the will of your own flesh. You are powerless against it. So if God put the thorn there, God's even saying to you, my grace is sufficient. Even in that thorn, my grace that I'm giving you is better than me removing it. Because while that thorn is there, you can stay humble. You'll be on your knees praying. You'll be right with me and I'll bless you. And so Paul said, I'll glory in that. I accept that. That's, that's, God being our prayer partner. Ephesians, um, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. I don't know why I had Ephesians 6, 18 twice, but 1 Corinthians 14. And then uh, next Wednesday night, we'll talk about the Holy Ghost being the, the preserver of the saints. I believe in preservation. Yes, I believe in preservation. I also believe in perseverance. And I do not believe the two are contradictory to each other. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Which is a statement made by Paul that contradicts this idea that praying in tongues is superior to praying in your known language. Because I have read and I've heard people tell me this. When I pray in the Spirit, it just seems like God answered those prayers better. I do not agree with that. And the Scripture does not believe that either. Paul said, when I, I will pray with the Spirit... And with the understanding. I'll know what I'm praying. And those who say that they pray in tongues. Not speak in tongues like out in a church where there's all this nut stuff going on. But they say that they pray in a heavenly language. And they don't know what it is they're saying. How do you know what you're saying? How do you even know what you ask for? If you don't know what you're saying. How do you even know you're praying to God? Because you don't understand a word of it. And Paul said, I will pray in the spirit. I will pray with the understanding. So, no, I don't agree that praying in tongues is a gains you better access to God or gives 
makes God respond better to your prayers or praying in tongues guarantees that God will give you what you ask. I do not believe that at all. And neither does Paul. First Corinthians 14, 15. I will pray in the spirit. I will pray with the understanding. So then next, like I say, next week, well, we're going to study how God seals us. You can know. You can know beyond a doubt that you're saved. Whereas you have, like the Catholic Church, you'll have other churches telling you that you're always wavering with salvation. Oh, you don't know from day to day whether or not you're going to have to go through purgatory or go to hell. Or, you don't know that. Uh, yeah, I believe I can know that. I believe God preserves and causes us to persevere. I don't think the two are contradictory at all. Well, my little alien still here, so. Amen. Did, did you notice my DNA tie? It's got the four letters A, C, T, and G on here. It's the human genome. It's my DNA tie. <laughs> 